Hello everyone. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the evaluation uh, approach for solitary pulmonary nodule. Uh, so the objectives today, uh, we need to answer the questions. Uh, oh man, I don't tell anybody about uh, how I earn. <laughs> so uh, so uh, what we need, uh, the questions that we need to answer today in my presentation is uh, when you see a lung nodule, is it benign or malignant? Uh, who should be screened for lung cancer when you see, uh, uh, when you have a patient in the clinic? How to follow up lung nodules? and uh, how to approach and biopsy lung nodule. So starting with the definition, it's the nodule is a coin lesion, uh, less than three centimeter. We all know that uh, any lesion more than three centimeter is considered a mass. Um, it's completely surrounded by lung parenchyma, and the patients are usually asymptomatic, and typically no associated other features in their imaging, like no uh, other uh, related atelectasis, pleural effusion, or hyaluronic adenopathy. So uh, this is a case for a patient that we commonly see in our pulmonary clinic uh, for a patient 66 year old female who's actively smoking, uh, has history, uh, a smoking history of 50 back here. Um, she had a CT chest uh, for lung screening, uh, lung cancer screening and uh, she has uh, her significant uh, past medical history uh, is COPD uh, with FEV1 of 20% and she's on home oxygen and she has uh, no family history of lung cancers. And this is her CT scan. As you see here, there is a solid nodule, uh, eight millimeter in, in, the, in size. And now the question that you ha we, ha we wanna answer, is it benign or malignant? What I'm gonna do next? Uh, do we need to follow up imaging for this uh, study? Do we need to biopsy or not? And if we're gonna biopsy, how to approach? Uh, does it need wedge resection? Overall, the solitary pulmonary nodules uh, are found in about 0.09 to 0.2 percent of all the radiographic uh, chest imaging, uh, approximately about 1 to 500. Uh, nine, 90 percent of the time, it's incidentally found, uh, and about 150,000 nodules are detected every year in the United States. The screening studies uh, showed the prevalence of malignancy ranging between 2 to 13 percent, and the studies use the PET scan in general, like for assessment of nodules, which is basically by the time you consider the, the nodules as high risk, has prevalence, uh, malignancy prevalence of about 46 to 82 percent. Then you start thinking about the nodule and you have the patient in the clinic with this abnormal CT scan and you're going to think about the differential. Um, the most serious is basically the malignancy when the patient gets uh, refer to you because it's the most concerning for any uh, physician sees uh, any abnormal CT scan. So it can be primary lung cancer or metastasis from somewhere else or a carcinoid tumor, uh, which is typically it's endobronchial, but in about 20% it's peripheral and can be seen as solitary nodule. The other differential is including the benign causes of solitary nodule. And that's the important part. Like, um, when we see these patients, we have to dig more in the history and we have to uh, know about their, uh, the, the circumstances and their past medical history that can lead us to know exactly the etiology of the nodule, uh, which uh, a lot of us, uh, including me, miss a lot of times uh, when we take the history. So uh, benign tumors could be the cause of this, the nodule, like the hamartoma, the chondroma, or the lipomas, or inflammatory conditions, such as autoimmune disease, and in this picture, you're going to see a lot of uh, clinical criteria uh, that can uh, lead you to, uh, to these causes. And you can do more uh, uh, lab work to confirm the diagnosis. And you can see in dermatoid arthritis or other autoimmune disease or infectious. Again, ask the patient about the TB exposure, any uh, travel history, any previous admissions or uh, significant infections, uh, because it can be typical or atypical infection leading to the nodule. Also vascular causes and yeah, a lot of other disease. And also, uh, if you're assessing a nodule with x-ray, it can be not in the lung. And that's how we trick our first year fellows in the x-ray conference, like the nipple shadows or the skin nodules. Now, how it looks, the nodule in the radiograph. <laughs> 
So when we assess the first part, we assess the, uh, we assess the size. Size is very important for evaluation of nodule and the risk of malignancy. The main three uh, screening trials uh, showed like that there is a huge increase in the risk of malignancy after the after the size of 10 millimeters. So the bigger the nodule, the higher the risk of malignancy, and jumps up. Uh, really significantly to about 40% if it's more than 3 centimeters when it's a mass. The size, measurement of the size is important. A lot of studies, um, uh, screening trials, showed that they use the maximum diameter, transverse diameter, to assess the size of the <coughs> nodule. And a lot of other studies, they assess the, the average of the bidimensional diameter, the longitudinal and the transverse. The most of the prediction models for the malignancy showed the higher yield to uh, confirm ma malignancy with uh, actually the average diameter, the bidimensional diameter. And the Fleischner Society uh, recommended using the, the average of bidimensional diameter, and they have been using it since 2005. Uh, and uh, they recommended m mentioning uh, if, if it's above 10 millimeter, you start assess the, long the, uh, the, 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 the longest. Uh, diameter of the nodule. So, so it was like less than eight. So how, how could you repeat what you So, so like yeah, when you assess the size, so in this condition, like you have a, a solid nodule, okay. uh, seven by four millimeter. Okay, so the average size is five point five. So we don't take the seven and four Fleischner. No, no. According to the Fleischner guidelines, they go with the the bidimensional dam. The the, the 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 Fleischner guidelines that we have. We never get the five point five millimeter. You calculate it. You calculate the longest, the longitudinal, and the transverse. But that's not the way. I mean, when we see CT scans, yeah. they're giving us the transverse the diameter. The long, yeah. Whatever. They're giving us the longest yeah. diameter. But ac according to the, the Fleischner guidelines and uh, even the, the most recent uh, publication in uh, January 2017, they have been recommending using the bidimensional diameter. The average by the mention. But our radiologists do not do that, as far as I can tell. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they put it in. We can have last yeah. an hour. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> sometimes they follow the how many cuts on the case skin you have the nodule on. Mm -hmm. But they give you the larger the numbers. They usually give you the one. And that's uh, actually, uh, that makes more sense because it's important when you assess malignancy, uh, the, the volume double time. Yeah. So, so that's like when you assess the volume, you, you need the volume exactly. The so you have it's, it makes more sense if you assess the bidimensional diameter. <coughs> then the attenuation of the nodule. Solid nodules are more common, way more common than uh, ground glass or semi-solid. Uh, the the in in general the the likelihood of uh, malignancy is uh, higher with uh, the partly solid or ground glass. And there is increase in the incidence or uh, the prevalence of uh, having ground glass lesions because of the increasing uh, incidence of uh, adenocarcinoma worldwide. Growth also, like, and how we, uh, we see the nodules and the follow-up. Overall, solitary nodules stable for two years considered to be benign. Um, and usually we, uh, we assess, and that's the preferred, to assess the nodules with serial CT scan. X-rays are not accurate and has poor uh, positive predictive value. Most of the malignant uh, nodules have doubling, doubling time between 20 to 400 days. Uh, slower nodules, uh, sl sorry, slower doubling time uh, can be seen in uh, some slowly growing cancers like in carcinoid or P-invasive or uh, low grade adenocarcinoma. And the subsolid nodules likely seen with low, uh, low grade adenocarcinoma which have slower doubling time. A uh, retrospective study showed that the volume doubling time uh, of malignant no nodules according to the attenuation uh, about uh, 813 days for the ground glass nodules and about 457 days for the semi-solid or the ground glass with the solid component and 149 days in the solid ones. So overall the, the, the ground glass or the semi-solid nodules are more suspicious. Two years, most of the time is not enough. So the recommendation is, is Fall off for three years or more, and uh, be more cautious with such lesions because the suspicion of the risk of malignancy is higher. 
We cannot ignore the margins when we talk about the nodules. <laughs> so it can be lobulated in uh, about 80% of malignant. It has, uh, if, if it's lobulated, there is 80% chance to be malignant. Speculated with invasion of uh, the surrounding parenchyma and also has a very high risk of being malignant, about 88 to 94%. Or smooth, which is mostly benign. And only 30% of the, of the times is malignant. It can be polygonal in shape, and uh, that's mostly benign lesion. You can see it like if there is mucus impaction in some, sort, in some conditions with infection or inflammations. It's not specific, but it can be malignant too. And the halo sign, which uh, a lot of us get excited when we see a similar lesion. Uh, in the past, it was proposed to be a specific finding uh, for the invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. But uh, it can be anything else. It can uh, be related to infection with hemorrhage, uh, with some cert uh, certain inflammation uh, or autoimmune disease like Wagner or metastatic angiosarcoma. Calcification, assessment of the calcification pattern of the lung nodule is also important. A um, lot of calcification patterns really suggest the, that the, the etiology of the lesion is benign. Uh, if it's uh, dense central calcification, laminated, the popcorn. And the popcorn usually um, happens because of a lot of uh, chondroid material or matrix in the lung nodule, which we see a lot in the hamartomas. So uh, that's suggestive of, of such uh, disease or, or uh, etiology, and the diffuse calcification. Calcification also can uh, be stippled or eccentric, uh, and that, that, that suspects a lot uh, to be malignant in etiology. Location is important. Um, upper lobes, uh, if, if we see the nodules in the upper lobes, it's more concerning for uh, malignancy. Uh, there is a study published in the New England Journal, uh, about 7,000 nodules uh, were assessed and 102 of them were malignant, and two, two thirds of these malignant nodules were in the upper lobes. Uh, the more dense also the nodules, the higher, the higher risk for malignancy. So <coughs> overall density of 40 to 200, the Hounsfield units uh, uh, increased suspicion of malignant. Cavitation, the nodules can be cavitated. Um, if the wall is less than 5 millimeter, usually indicates benign etiology, but if it's more than 15 millimeter, it's uh, highly concerning for malignancy. Then the risk factors. So you saw the nodule, you saw the x-ray, you saw the image, and you had an idea about uh, the, how it looks and uh, according to the size and the attenuation and all the, the factors that I mentioned earlier. If it's benign, if it's raising the suspicion of benign or malignant, so it's the history part. We have to uh, get good history from the patients uh, to assess the risk factors. Definitely, the age is uh, is really important uh, because the studies showed that above the age of 50, the risk of uh, lung cancer increased significantly to 43 percent, and way higher in the 60, over 60. Also, history of smoking. Being actively smoker is a, is a really highly, uh, high uh, risk factor. Family history of lung cancer, female six, so don't look for the Y chromosome. Uh, emphysema also is a risk factor for lung cancer and prior malignancy. So they developed a, 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 a and a module to, uh, to divide the, the risk for malignancy into three main categories, the low, the moderate, and high, according to these risk factors. And that's when you assess the nodules. So um, in the low, in the, the low risk is basically if it's less than eight millimeter, middle eight to 20, and the high when the, the nodule is really bigger, more than 20 millimeter in size. And the higher the age, the higher the risk as well. Any history of cancer really increases the risk much higher. The smoking history, if the patient never smoked, it's a low risk. If you smoke uh, less than a pack a day or more than a pack a day, assess for middle or high. And if they quit smoking, it's important to know when <coughs> did they quit. Quitting uh, more than seven years ago or less than seven years ago can put them between low and moderate risk. And never, uh, never, or actively smokers 
uh, active smoker is, is basically a high risk for cancer, history of COPD, history of asbestos exposure, uh, and uh, the nodal characteristics according to the, the uh, features that I mentioned earlier. So the low probability, basically the risk of cancer is less than 5%. The intermediate is 5 to 65, or, and the high probability is more than 65. Mayo Clinic had developed a, a, mo a developed module to uh, evaluate lung cancer, and basically it's, uh, they have a, their own calculator, and actually they have application to assess the, the risk of lung cancer. And they based this on uh, multiple, multiple logistic regression analysis in uh, 419 patients with non-calcified nodules uh, that measure between 4 and 30 millimeters in diameters. So now the time to think about screening, how to screen. The landmark trial that was uh, published in the New England Journal in August 2011 that was done uh, was a prospective randomized control trial on more than 53,000 individuals with high risk for lung cancer. And they randomized them uh, into two groups, basically uh, the group that was screened with low dose uh, CT scan and the other group screened with chest x-ray. They did annual screening, uh, th basically for three years, and the positive test, they assessed the nodule based on the, the greatest transverse diameter of four millimeter not the bidimensional diameter. And uh, the primary endpoint was lung cancer mortality. The way they recruited the patient, the, the criteria basically, the patient should not have any symptoms of lung cancer, ages of uh, 55 to 74, more than 30 pack year history of smoking, no prior lung cancer, and medically fit for surgery. So before they assess the patient or they uh, started them on the screening protocol, they have to make sure they can be fit for surgery. And here's what they found. There was, uh, so uh, uh, among the two arms of the study, the, the people, the individuals who were screened with low dose CT scan and the chest radiograph, there was significant uh, higher detection rate of uh, cancer in the CT scan group. On the other hand, uh, the low dose CT scan showed significantly uh, lower mortality uh, than the other group and basically there was a relative risk reduction of uh, 20% and at that time it was considered like uh, significant and there were a lot of debates uh, after this study about uh, screening um, Medicare at that time spent a while uh, uh, fighting against the annual screening and uh, there was a lot of criticism on this study but uh, the USPSTF made recommendations uh, for annual low-dose uh, CT scan screening in 2013. And basically, and these are the criteria that we have to make sure and uh, consider when we order a CT scan. In the beginning, when we, when we order the CT scan or we ask the patient for screening, you have to ask the patient, is he willing to undergo treatment before uh, if, if anything, any incidental findings uh, seen in the CT scan or not? That uh, can be going to uh, invasive procedures, can, uh, the patient can get chemotherapy. We a lot of times miss this, uh, to ask this question, but it's, it's really important. Uh, the patient should, ha should not have any symptoms suspecting lung cancer or any respiratory infection in the past 12 weeks because it's going to affect your image and you might see uh, abnormal findings and can confuse you more and uh, lead to further uh, unnecessary studies. Age of 55 to 80. Minimum smoking history of 30 pack year. 20, 25, 26, the patient is, is not a uh, candidate for lung screening. A former smoker and quit more than 15 years. So if the patient quit like more than 15 years ago, he does not fit for annual lung screening. And no, uh, no previous history of lung cancer or metastatic potential within the last five years. The USPSTF also made recommendation when to discontinue screening. It's basically if, uh, if the person not smoked for more than 15 years, that's when, that's when you can discontinue or develop other health problems that can limit the life expectancy or affect the, the treatment plan 
for any uh, uh, recognized cancer. And that's great B recommendation. <coughs> and when we start screening, it's important to, to know the potential harms of, uh, of these studies and starting uh, to screen. Uh, first of all, the consequences of evaluating abnormal findings. So among the results of the, the main trial, uh, the lung screening trial, there were 96% false, uh, like among the positive results, 96% were false positive and not leading to diagnosis of cancer. And 11% of the positive results led to invasive studies. And most of the positive uh, studies basically show uh, the, the, on this trial were resolved with the uh, follow-up imaging. So uh, a lot of uh, the studies, a lot of abnormal findings led to invasive, uh, invasive interventions and the others were positive and, uh, and were, were resolved like spontaneously. Also, the other uh, problem and the potential harm for screening is patient distress. Prolonged follow-up of nodules and putting the patient under stress that uh, the suspected lung cancer can, uh, can cause a lot of anxiety and fear of having lung cancer. And actually, there were multiple uh, studies done and there was a, tw uh, a, a, a systematic review in 2014 on five trials, randomized trials on one cohort study, um, assessed the... Um, on the patients who got screening with low dose CT scan, um, they showed that those patients have short term psychological discomfort, but over, or, overall there was no uh, um, there was no long term distress, worry, or uh, health related quality of life. And the most important part is the overdiagnosing, overdiagnosing cancers in, uh, in when you uh, screen for lung cancer with a low dose CT scan. Some cancers were identified and found like there was no, uh, it would not affect basically the, the morbidity or the mortality or the long-term outcome. Basically such as like the low-grade uh, the, the low invasive tumors, the PAC. Um, so uh, there were more than 18% of the CT screens detected the lung cancer were overdiagnosed, about 22.5% showed minimally invasive uh, non-small uh, uh, cell lung cancer and 78% uh, PAC. And about 111 cases of the PACs were detected in the low-dose CT scan group and about 36 in the chest X-ray group. And there was a, a lot of criticism about this, like there was more diagnosing uh, of the PAC and the low-dose CT scan, so that might be affecting the detection rate of, uh, of cancer in the low dose CT scan group. But um, the argument against that was the, the low dose CT scan screen group showed decrease in uh, mortality. So that pushed uh, further to uh, go for screening as uh, and uh, When we talk about lung cancer screening, this is always the part I struggle with. Yes. So, do any of us think that if we knew a patient had bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma, we would ignore it? Not ignore it, but uh, a lot of times, so I have... But, but the, the term overdiagnosis is really meant to mean the way we think about prostate cancer, right? You can die with prostate cancer rather than dying of prostate cancer. Yeah. But there are some patients who do ignore it, right, or would like to. If I have an 80-year-old patient with an FEV1 of athletes... Oh, sure. So, I mean, it's not completely right. irrelevant circumstance. What's the doubling time of prostate cancer? <laughs> so, I mean, if you, if, if you have a doubling time of a cancer that's equates of lung cancer that equates that of prostate cancer, then your question is, would you leave, if you leave a prostate lung cancer sitting in your chest, the same way you would leave a prostate cancer sit, then the answer would be yes. But we, yeah, no, it's my point, I guess, I mean, I, I think there's lots of patients with, a lot of men with prostate cancer who know they have prostate cancer and go to a doctor and a doctor says... Mm -hmm. I'm just going to watch it. I'm watching a, a PAC normal, in my in clinic. A otherwise healthy 60-year-old who's getting lung cancer screening, if you knew they had bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma, would you say, let's just watch it and see what happens? Well, or would you take it out? Know. You just assume it is because it's just a round glass thing. You magically know what it is, which means they got a biopsy. 
No, let's say, I mean, again, for the sake of argument, you knew what it was. You really you would. Take it out. You would take it out. Yeah, yeah, I just, I don't, that, I struggle with this. I mean, I know I, we say it, they say it. I just don't. Overdiagnosis to me seems like a funny risk. The, 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 they mention it based on the, the expected life, ex the, the life expectancy of the, of the patient. So if you have a patient, like as Dr. Litt said, like a 75 year, and you have a small lesion of five millimeter or so ground glass, and you know it's uh, PAC, you're gonna send such a patient uh, and push for like resection or uh, treatment, or you're just gonna watch? It's so assessment of think, risk I versus think, benefit. I think there are some patients where there could be harm of over screening, but I think they would fall into the group that I think that I just identified. So the, 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 the spectrum is <coughs> different, right? So there are some patients you shouldn't probably screen and, and so forth. But as opposed to prostate cancer, the group is much smaller yeah. and is closer to the end of life and so forth. So, yeah. And, and I think the, the I think the other side of the argument there, the Dr. Nassar's uh, point was, you know, the mortality rates are just not different. So the age of diagnosis is a lot different to when prostate cancer majority happens in the elderly with the long uh, you know, you can diagnose it early and the patient's survival would be higher depending on, I guess, the P PSA acceleration. They don't, they don't, that's what really predicts their mortality and the uh, decent score. But in, in PAC, definitely they have higher mortality and you tend to get them, though elderly and women, you just, they probably would die of the BAC if you don't act on it. Just in general. You're assuming that every, oh, yeah. every non small cell carcinoma biologically acts exactly the same. They don't. Uh, Homie's told you that, but he says the, net, the doubling time range is for a cancer between 20 days and 400 days. That's the mean doubling time. And it can be 800 days in the slowly growth so, cancer. I mean, so that's the, that, the counter argument there is if we're the doubling time may predict the cancer's ability to metastasize uh, to the lymph nodes, which eventually uh, the stage would predict the, the mortality of, of the disease. But there are also some biological difference in terms of aggressiveness. What I'm saying is, it could be benign or, you know, indolent, but there are certainly those aggressive types. So, I mean, I wouldn't leave it in the chest. Uh, if I found it out, just because the, more, the general mortality rates of lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, compared to prostate cancer, are different too. So that's my point. So as, a, as an average, that's true. But in each individual, I mean, you probably have, how many people are you following mm -hmm. in your clinic now that have brown glass nodules that are 8 millimeters in size that you've been following that the 8 millimeters nodule hasn't changed? That's probably, and if, and if you could prove that it's new, that's probably a BAC, but you're following. Yeah, but what I'm saying is if you're following, you're not biopsying. But if you biopsy, then there is definitely a change in biological behavior. So I would take it out. So uh, think about it also like your population or the patients that you uh, uh, screen for lung cancer. The high risk, they, most of them, like, they have COPD, emphysema, they have other comorbidities, and so you have to assess this most of the time. And that was considered also in, like, overdiagnosing the patient. The life expectancy is not like just that this patient has 55 years or has 70 years and he's expected to live. No, he had, has other comorbidities. So that's your evaluation every time. And discussion also with the patient himself. Like, what do you want us to do? And that's, that's a <coughs> Yeah, my struggle is the counsel that comes into your clinic that was scanned by, by their, you know, primary care physician without really respect of whether they would undergo surgery or what the true lung function is. Yes. They come to you with that ground glass nodule now and you have to do something about mm -hmm. it. And I think we've been kind of successful recently with getting SBRT in these patients and they end up doing well. And it's kind of led me to question who I'm going to screen, you know, based on FEV1 or based on how well they're going to tolerate surgery, if just radiation alone is an option in terms of like how long I need to do. But Brian, the, the SBRT 
those they have like those who were documented increase in size and those who there was an attempt right. to buy C and there's no result that came down. So there's like I mean I don't know how much curative that is. Right. So we still have algorithm, and they try to make some modifications after this screening I will talk about also. Um, they made the, the American College of Radiology made the lung rest criteria because after the, the screening trial uh, that was published, and as I mentioned, they, uh, they assess according to the, uh, the transverse diameter of 4 millimeter and above to be considered as a positive study. So they changed it to, no, it's going to be 6 millimeter. Uh, the transverse bidimensional average. And with this, it decreased the false positive rates from 26% to 12.8%. However, there was a, there was a concern that, uh, that makes it less sensitive uh, and you might miss some cancers, but there was another retrospective study applied the lung rates <coughs> on more than 2,000 uh, high-risk patients, and they, they found a reduction of the overall positive uh, false positive rates from 27.6% to 10.6% uh, without affection of the, uh, of the sensitivity, without uh, increase in the false negative rate. So uh, the overall, the, the goal for applying the ACR uh, or American College of Radiology Lung Reds criteria to standardize reporting basically for patients who are getting screening for lung cancer, uh, reduce the confusion, facilitate the outcome, monitoring and reduce the false positive rate, which was the most important issue. And these are the ACR uh, lung rats criteria. Remember, such patients, uh, they come to you, this is not the, f uh, the this, it's derived from the basic, the main Flushner criteria that we follow uh, when we assess an incidentally found lung nodule, but this is for a patient who are you screening for, to not get confused. The, 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 uh, uh, divided them into four main groups. The first two groups basically is the negative or the it's, uh, it's likely benign nodule or lesion and the second two groups is probably benign with some suspicion of malignancy and the fourth group is suspicious. So uh, you can uh, the criteria based on uh, if you're seeing the, the nodule for the first time or that was a follow-up nodule. So the group one Basically, if there was uh, no lung nodule or there is nodule with uh, v a specific calcification that suspects uh, benign uh, etiology that we mentioned before, and that's requiring continual, uh, of, uh, continuation of annual screening uh, basically every two months. Or benign appearance. So if you have a solid nodule, uh, less than 6 millimeter, or new, uh, less than 4 millimeter, according to previous study that you're uh, uh, comparing with, or partially solid nodule less than 6 millimeter, or non-solid nodule less than 20 millimeters. And also indicates annual screening every, like, uh, with low-dose CT scan. The probably benign, or group 3, if uh, you have a solid nodule 6 to 8 millimeter, or a new nodule 4 millimeter to 6, and that requires 6 months. Uh, follow-up uh, low-dose CT scan and the partly solid like more than six millimeter and you go up w w when you go uh, bigger with the size it requires more uh, uh, like more frequent screening but here in the suspicious group when you uh, start to have a nodule solid nodule from eight millimeter then you have to act on it either get a, another C a CT scan in three months or get a PET scan for further evaluation uh, and if it's really bigger than 15 millimeter, you can start considering biopsy and uh, maybe wedge resection if the risk is really high for malignancy. And these are the Fleischner criteria that, uh, and uh, with the most recent update uh, that was published in uh, just in January 2017. Um, my co-fellows uh, who took the board exam with me uh, remember, like when uh, we start screening, we start for, we start from four millimeters. But now uh, things changed. They shifted the, the table more uh, to start screening at, at the size of six millimeter. So uh, with the low risk, uh, low risk group with a nodule of six millimeter and below, there's no required follow up. And uh, very opposite, like if you have a solid nodule in a high risk patient with more than eight millimeters, you consider the CT scan screening. Um, I haven't read the new guidelines. The old guidelines described risk as smoker. Mm -hmm. Do the new guidelines talk about the lung cancer screening 
so where we run into trouble, at least where I run into trouble, so low risk, so if a non-smoker gets a CT, that's mm -hmm. easy. If a current smoker gets a CT, it's easier. So what if you have somebody who's got a 20-pack year smoking who quit 20 years ago? Are they low risk or high risk? So as I mentioned uh, before, the, there are calculators and... No, uh, no, but I mean according to Fleischner. The Fleischner? Fleischner. Yeah. Do we follow low risk for them or high risk? I cannot remember exactly uh, if... I know if, the old ones, yeah. they would be high risk. And maybe yeah. they still are high risk. That's the, that's the only change they, they made this okay. year, as I remember. So Same recommendation, but oh, I see what you yeah. mean. Okay, oh, I got you. Also, the change was in uh, the subsolid nodules. So it was starting from five millimeter. Now it's six millimeter. The the screening. Uh, sorry, the follow up for the lung uh, nodules. With the same uh, guidelines uh, regarding the follow up Just intervals. Four to six. Yes, four to six, and from five to six for the subsolid nodules. Yes. So this is the algorithm that. Uh, that you can find uh, on the SCP guidelines for uh, the the nodules more than eight millimeters, uh, basically eight to three, 30, uh, 30 millimeters. So you assess in the beginning the surgical risk. That's the most important. And after this, you start to uh, do your workup and evaluation. So if the patient has low or moderate risk for surgery, then you assess the probability of cancer and the risk of malignancy. If it's very low, you do uh, the CT surveillance uh, as uh, per, uh, per the guidelines. If the risk is uh, high, you, uh, you start act upon it. If uh, with, uh, with either like surgical resection or SBRT and, and you get biopsies, so you assess according to the, the diagnosis. Or if it's low to moderate, you go with the PET scan. So uh, if the PET scan is negative, you either go with the CT surveillance or non-surgical biopsy because there are some cancers slowly growing that you're going to have uh, low metabolism and not going to show up as negative or mild uptake in the PET scan. But if the PET is high, uh, showed high uptake, you, you act more, uh, try to get tissue samples with a non-surgical biopsy or surgical resection basically. Now on the other arm, when the patient is high risk for malignancy, you, you discuss with the patient and you assess according to the, the current comorbidities and, uh, and if the patient is fit and can uh, go for bronchoscopy and getting a non-surgical biopsy, you go ahead with it. And uh, after this, according to the diagnosis, if it's malignant, uh, you can maybe go the route of, uh, of SBRT uh, because such patients are not going to be canned for surgery and also according to the discussions with the patient and, and uh, Assessing, assessing the life expectancy. Uh, or you can go with, uh, with the CT surveillance if you're not able to get really an answer uh, or treat specifically according with chemotherapy maybe, either curative or palliative. Talking about the PET scan for evaluation of lung nodules, so uh, a prospective study was done on about 90 patients in five centers uh, assessing the indeterminate nodules. Uh, with the size ranging from 0.7 to 4 centimeter, and they found about 67% of them were malignant. And uh, with uh, SUV and uptake of about 2.5, uh, more than 2.5, uh, it has a really high sensitivity of about 90 to 100 percent, with a, a bit of lower specificity of 69 to 95 percent. Uh, you can see false positive. Uh, 
lesions in uh, like in active granulomas, infections, uh, and false negative also in the conditions like PAC, the mucinous carcinoma, carcinoid, or also hyperglycemia. And we all know that uh, uh, the tracer is uh, 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 that, that we give in the PET scan is basically uh, 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 sugary. So uh, <laughs> can affect the uh, hyperglycemia can affect the uptake. Uh, another meta-analysis and, effect, uh, and uh, reviewed about 450 nodules showed uh, that the evaluation of the nodules with PET scan has about mean sens sensitivity of 93.9% and median sensitivity of 98%, which is pretty high, and the specificity was averaging about 85%. So in general, uh, when to order the PET scan is basically for nodules eight, uh, more than 8 millimeter in diameter, but overall, less than one centimeter, it's, it has lower sensi sensitivity. So in general, we try to consider it more for lesions more than one centimeter. It can help you to get some staging information, but it's not a tool to, uh, to stage the patient for cancer. So uh, that's not an answer in the board question for staging. Uh, and up to 14% of the patients uh, are eligible for surgery and can uh, have uh, extra thoracic lesions. So the PET scan is going to be useful to, uh, to assess that and, make, and, and give you the information that the, the, the cancer is metastatic. Now, the way to approach for biopsy can be by um, CT-guided uh, thoracic needle aspiration uh, by the IR. Again, uh, it has about diagnosis rate of uh, 65 to 94 percent. Uh, the possible complications are pneumothorax in about 15 to 43 percent. Uh, patients can need chest tube in about 4 to 18 percent, hemorrhage and embolism. And the uh, risk goes higher if the lesion is small, deep, uh, if the, there is emphysema around, uh, near to a fissure, or there is a small angle that you can reach uh, through the pleura. Uh, you can get the biopsy with, uh, with uh, bronchoscopy, with transbronchial biopsies. And the diagnosis rate uh, for the smaller lesions, less than 2 centimeters, is about 33%. And uh, the yield is higher with bigger lesions, uh, more than 3 centimeters, which is basically when it's a mass. Uh, it's a safe procedure, well tolerated, and has higher accuracy for the central lesions. Uh, and there are... New modalities of uh, in bronchoscopies too, uh, like the ultra thin bronchoscopy, the guide sheath, where you can advance it and advance the radial EBUS with it to reach the, the peripheral lesions, radial uh, EBUS, uh, the navigation bronch, or you can use the, the combination of, uh, of those tools, the, the same as we uh, do in our, our bronchoscopy suite, and that increases the aid for preferred nodules. Or you can go the route of uh, having a uh, sending the patient to the thoracic surgeon for wedge resection or lobectomy if there is a really high suspicion of cancer and no evidence of uh, other lesions anywhere. So uh, the patient, uh, the, the, in the wedge resection, the diagnosis rate is definitely pretty high, 90 to 95 percent, and the risk of complications is not that high, 0.5 percent. In lobectomy, the complication about 4 percent, uh, and about in, in 12 percent of the cases, uh, the, the surgeon uh, has to, uh, to convert to thoracotomy. This is a pretty decent and uh, nice table to help you uh, when you uh, assess a patient with a uh, lung nodule in your clinic after having these studies about how to approach and uh, what's the most probable uh, study that you're going to uh, uh, end up doing for, for evaluation of the cancer. It depends on the surgical risk, the clinical probability of cancer, and the biopsy risk. So the, the, higher, the, the higher the risk of, uh, of malignancy, uh, it's going to be more, you're going to do more intervention. So basically, you might, if the, the risk is really high, a small nodule, the patient is fit for surgery, you can do wedge resection. And if the risk is smaller, uh, the risk is, uh, of surgical, the surgical risk is, is lower. Uh, and uh, you can start like just with, uh, with the CT scan uh, surveillance. Uh, again, uh, oh, I mean for the, the cancer. Uh, the, the, the risk for cancer. So, so those patients have to be back to surgery and not Based on the algorithm that you... No, no, you do... Uh, so it, it depends. I don't know, because this is a very low correct your algorithm, your chest algorithm. Yeah, go, no, no. Yeah, so here there's no... Yeah. 
So the, the higher the risk for malignancy, the, the, the more intervention that you do, but it is based on the surgical risk. So the higher the surgical risk, you would try to be less invasive, either with um, maybe radiotherapy or chemo or, or basically the SBRT, or you try to be uh, 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 like just CT surveillance according to discussion with the patient. So the take-home points is uh, it's the, the important it's important to know the characteristics of uh, benign and malignant nodules uh, on the CT scan and imaging studies in general, uh, assessing the risk of lung cancer while screening or evaluating for uh, uh, nodules, uh, and it's different than uh, in follow-up between the incidentally found nodules or the nodules that you uh, detect with lung uh, cancer screening. Uh, annual low-dose CT scan in high-risk patients who are meeting the criteria and make sure we ask the questions, the proper questions before we order the study. Uh, the lung grads algorithm for lung cancer screening uh, and the algorithmic approach for management of nodules. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Diaz uh, for helping out with my presentation. And uh, also, we, all, uh, we always remember Dr. Ray, especially when I talk about an intervention topic. And uh, I'm open for questions. Yes. So I've been told by unnamed fellows that, um, that there, there is not, I guess, general understanding of our lung cancer screening program that we do have here. So Rachel Edwards here, she's one of our nurse practitioners who's on the program. So their goal, the program's goal is really to try, the, the issue is that for patients who meet lung cancer screening guidelines, as you, as you describe them, they need a specific clinic visit in which the risks and benefits yes. that you just went over are going over yes. with the patient in that a code is used to bill for that visit. Because there are, we don't feel like that's being done in primary care, we're trying to take the bulk of that in mm. our bone cancer screening okay. clinic, which is run by Dr. Simoff. Um, but all of you can certainly order lung cancer screening CTs on your patients. I hope you are. And I hope you're using the right codes um, and using the, and answering the questions that are on the CT sc screening um, questionnaire. Um, but that program might be calling your patients if you, if you have patients who qualify and haven't been offered lung cancer screening. But also, again, you're you're welcome to order them on your own patients and to follow them according to the lung reds criteria as you put them out. Practice, 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 practice.